today we see how we can uh, create models of a building and then uh, create uh, the pi foundations and if you want you know you can even create a rough foundation for it but uh, first we look at uh, pi foundation and then uh, we see you know what are the different ways we can uh, get the loads on the piles and so on one of the advantages of doing computer modeling is you know you will be able to model uh, large pile caps and uh, obtain the forces that you need for design so uh, even if the pile cap is irregular still you will be able to get forces so uh, when you are doing manual calculations you know you can do it easily for regular situations but when you are doing computer modeling you can always have irregular shapes and so on so we'll uh, select this particular building and uh, so if i uh, draw the details of the building it will be like this so basically we will uh, select a building having uh, four base in each direction so this way we'll say it's uh, six meters each And this way we say it's 7.5 meters. And we say that uh, it has a leaf core. and each being uh, 2.5 meters and to balance this we are going to have some additional shear wall here like that so if you have a building like this there can be forces acting in uh, y direction and also forces acting in x direction x and y directions so you can have forces that will act on x and y directions so if you if the y forces are acting at the center here this direction and then you can see there's a wall on this side there's another wall on this side so it's like you know having to symmetrically arrange walls on either side of the center line on either side of the center line so because of this reason when the wind loads are acting in y direction this way there is uh, the build we can say the building is reasonably balanced reasonably balanced 
the reason is we are applying the forces at the center and we are resisting the forces with two symmetrically arranged walls on either side of the center line and on the center line also we have another wall so we have three walls resisting these forces so in y direction it's reasonably balanced and if you take moments for a equation written as y bar equal to sigma i y or sigma i or x bar is equal to sigma i x over sigma i so here you can see the important parameter is not the mass but the second amount of area because we are we are considering the flexural behavior of all these uh, walls so the important parameter that we have to consider is the the second amount of area and it's a good practice to ensure that uh, the buildings will not have unnecessary twisting so how do how we uh, ensure unnecessary twisting in the building is by balancing the building and how we balance the building is we actually take consider one direction one major direction and then see how the uh, strong elements or shear walls are arranged about that particular direction so if you to consider y direction you can see the building is reasonably balanced then we can select x direction and when you select x direction you can see there are six walls on this side or actually four walls on this side and one wall on the center line and then there's another wall on this side that balances these walls so ideal situation is if you perform this particular calculation about uh, so this particular calculation in this direction then if we can make sure that this y bar that is uh, the distance to the centroid or distance to the center of rigidity is again zero that means you know the center of rigidity is lying on this particular axis then we can say the structure is reasonably balanced then you'll ask why it's needed from the structural point of view it's good to have a balanced structure and from the geotechnical point of view also it's good to have a balanced structure because uh, the loads on the foundations will be uh, will not be will not vary drastically if the building is not twisting so if the building is twisting there is a possibility for a, major, a greater variation of forces whereas when there's no twisting the chances so variation could be lesser so from geotechnical point of view as well as structural point of view it's important it's very important from the structural point of view but to a lesser degree from the geotechnical point of view so what you do is if i say the length of this wall is x length of this wall is x what you are trying to see is when you substitute in this equation y bar is equal to sigma i y over sigma i then we are trying to see that y bar remains zero if we take moments about this particular axis so to do that we have to take the second amount of area of all these walls above the axis of bending 
So when the wind loads are acting in this direction, lateral loads are acting in this direction, the, the axis of bending will be something like this. So when you have the member this way, axis of bending will be like this. Axis of bending will be like this. And which means the I value of this wall, if it is having a thickness of 250 millimeters, 0.25, I value will be 112th, 0.25 multiplied by 2.5 cubed. The I value will be this. And then we can say, if we take moments about this axis, you can say, let's find this value. That value is 0.25 cubed, 0.25 into 2.5 cubed divided by 12. The answer is 0.325. So we can say 0.325 multiplied by, here the distance is six meters, six. And there are two walls like that. So multiplied by two. So here you can see these i, these i, these y, and because we are two walls, we are multiplied by two plus 0.325 multiplied by three meters multiplied by two minus if this side is plus y, this should be minus y, one twelfth 0.25 into x cubed multiplied by 6 divided by sigma i should be equal to 0. The reason is we have taken the moments about the centroid and we like the, the resultant centroid to be on the centroid, which means y bar is equal to 0. So from this equation, we can find the value for x cubed, and that is equal to 0.325 multiplied by six, multiplied by two, multiplied by six plus three, that is nine. And you can take this part to the other side of the equation. So you have to say multiplied by 12, multiplied by 0.25, multiplied by six, sorry, not multiplied, divided by 0 0.25, 0 0.25, divided by six, 46.8, and if you take the third root of that, you'll find that the length of the wall required is 3.59 meters, 3.59 meters. So X is equal to 3.59 meters, 3.59 meters. And we'll recheck the calculation again, 0.325 multiplied by two, multiplied by nine, multiplied by 12, divided by 0.25, divided by six, 46.8, and if you take third root of that, yes, the answer is 3.6 meters. Answer is 3.6 meters. So if you have a wall of 3.6 meters, then we can balance the building reasonably. So do you have any question on this? How to balance the buildings? so that the twisting can be minimized. Any question on this, please? Indunil, uh, can you understand that?
Herat? Can it's I okay, sir. Ah, it's okay. Right, okay. So the important equation is this one, you know, you where which you say the distance to the center of rigidity. Distance to the center of rigidity. So you have to find what is x bar and y bar. And if you can say x bar and y bar also coincide with the centroid of the building, then, uh, then the chances of twisting can be minimized or reduced. So with that, now we'll see how we can model this building. And uh, for that, I'll stop sharing this and then stop uh, share screen. And here I have this SAP 2000 with uh, so many things defined, like uh, load patterns are defined. And then uh, load. Load combinations are defined. All these combinations are there. And uh, you are reasonably familiar with these combinations because another earlier day to for the raft designs and inverted T designs, we uh, uh, make made use of all these combinations. They are the same combinations. For example, combination one is when all the dead loads are acting with maximum wind load. And combination two means with all the dead loads or permanent loads are acting at the maximum value. Uh, it's a small mistake here. And wind also acting. Oh yes, this correct. Okay. So here you get all the maximum loads acting with wind as the dominating force and uh, live load also effective, but uh, live load, only 70% of the live load is effective. So you get 1.5 multiplied by 0.7 is 1.05. So it should be 0.525. Okay, because we considered that, you know, only 50% of the live load will be uh, effective because all the flows are loaded simultaneously. So it should be 0.525, but I have used it as 0.55. So then you can get a third combination where the live loads are dominant Live loads are dominant. That is 1.5 multiplied by 0.5. And wind loads, only 50% of the wind loads are considered to act together. So can you remember I explained all these different combinations earlier day? Do you want me to explain it again? How the combinations have been uh, obtained? Can I get some feedback? Otherwise, I will simply use these combinations. And uh, we also have a combination four, which contains uh, the live loads and dead loads only. With the maximum values, again, you can see live load has been uh, considered as 75%, 50% uh, of the maximum live load. The reason is we are considering all the flows. And when you consider so many flows, we can go up to about 50% reduction on the live load. So that reduction has been used in this particular example. So, so what I do is, I'll save this as VUI1. And then remove this structure. 
so that uh, I can just show you the complete example with the recording so that you know you'll be able to go through it uh, from wherever you like so shall i do a complete example on this indunil with the pi foundation okay, pi caps ha huh? right okay right okay some of you would have seen some of these but you know for the benefit of everybody we'll do a complete example so that uh, you know every fine point can be discussed so now we have a structure so what you can do is we can go to 2d view and go to flow height of 3.6 and so we have a building and i have already defined the material so that's why i said you know i'm using this particular template and uh, beam concrete material has been defined as uh, 30 megapascal concrete 30 megapascal concrete the elastic modulus has been given as uh, 27 uh, 1000 not 27 1027 into 10, 10 to the power Six newtons per millimeter squared. Twenty-seven into ten to the power six uh, newtons per millimeter squared. So the the elastic modulus of concrete is twenty-seven uh, kilo newtons per millimeter squared. So it should be given as twenty-seven thousand. Newtons per millimeter squared. Okay, so we'll uh, just uh, define a new material, then we can see the units. And uh, here, if you go, yes, uh, it is equal to uh, the unit sign kilo newtons per meter squared. So that is twenty-seven uh, into ten to the power six kilo newtons per meter squared. So the unit is uh, 27 uh, into 10 to the power 6 kilo newtons per meter squared. So you can see it's correct. The beam concrete. You can see the E value is 27 into 10 to the power 6 kilo newtons per meter squared. Poisson's ratio has been taken as 0.2, and the density is taken as 24. and mass is taken as 2.4 tons per meter cube so those are the material properties but if you look at uh, slab concrete you will see a slight difference and later i will show you why we need a difference so we will not worry about that at the moment other properties are the same but only the weight is different so what i do is first i'll create the model by considering that the beam is 600 by 400 so i can draw this at the first floor level and then what i can do is can replicate select this replicate four times at a distance 6 meters and similarly i can draw the beam in the other direction and then select all of these and replicate four times in y direction on, on x direction and then 
I have to create this uh, I have to create these uh, walls and this is 3.6 meters I have to create these walls so let's see how to create those walls So I, what I can do is I can say replicate at 2.5 once oh, replicate at 2.5 once and then I can replicate on this side also replicate minus 2.5 okay. and I can replicate here minus 3.6 then I can divide these lines at into 2 is to 1 ratio which means I will not use the, this beam. There's a small beam that I have defined, which will not have much effect uh, even if I keep one extra beam. So it's a very small beam, we call it additional beam. So sometimes these kind of beams are necessary for applying loads and so on. So if I want, I can actually remove that later. So now I have all these elements and I will divide it there also. And uh, you can have a look at this diagram on the left hand side to see what's going on. So, and then I have to think of defining uh, the area section and I have already defined it because I removed the model and I'm doing it on the same model. And uh, if you look at uh, that section, it has a wall thickness of 250 millimeters and it's considered as a thin shell. So what I can do is I can select this. divide frames at intersection and now I can at once create all those shear walls that I like to have Then what I can do is I can extrude lines to areas, wall to 150, 0, minus 3.6, and once. So I can create the walls. Right. 
So now the walls have been created. And then uh, because the walls are there, I might need these beams. You can convert all those beams to the small beam. Uh, a sign. Yeah, that one. So you can see that, you know, I have created the core and I have allocated the, the, the beams above the walls to be very small ones because actually there's no wall, there's no beam on the wall. So I have, but I'm considering uh, those small beams to ensure that I can apply the loads on the walls. Then uh, I can also say that here also we don't have a proper beam. We have only a tiny beam to uh, apply the loads. So in this model, we don't have columns. So now you can create the columns. So the columns will come at these locations. And uh, there will be a column here, but no column here because the wall is there. No column here. And I will have a column there, there. And no need to have a column here, no need to have a column here. Columns, uh, columns are needed. These columns are needed. This is not necessary. So this is not necessary, this is not necessary. These four corners not necessary, but this is necessary. So all these columns that we need are marked. So no, nothing is marked around this. And here also I have not marked. And then I can extrude. Extrude. Oh. At the ground floor level, we select a column size of thousand by thousand. Now you can see all the columns have been generated. So now we can save the model. You can see uh, by using this extrude command, we can uh, fairly easily create a model provided the architectural details are available and uh, the grid arrangements have been uh, selected accordingly. So when the grids are there, you can just draw on the grid. So once we come to this level, We'll have to do a few things. One is, you know, we have to ensure that the structure is loaded. The foundations are, uh, you know, provided with some kind of support. So what we do is first we'll fix the foundations. So you can see, uh, we need uh, some kind of support at all these locations. So we say joint restraints and we'll keep it uh, simply supported for the uh, a pin support for the time being. A pin support for the time being. So now supports are there, the beams are there, steps are still missing 
and no loads have been applied on the structure except the loads that are calculated by the structure or the dead weight of the structure. So there are many ways of applying the loads. If you are going to model the steps with small elements, then you can apply the loads directly onto the slab. But here, what I'm going to do is, um, I'll deviate slightly from that practice. I will apply the loads on the beams for a unit load acting on the slab. For a unit load acting on the slab, I will see what are the effects on the surrounding beams, what are the effects on the surrounding beams. So what I do is, I will, uh, now I want to apply loads on all these members. And it's easier if I join these members before I apply any of these uh, loads. Join frames. Right. Now we look at this uh, 3D and uh, we'll apply the loads on these members. So we select all these elements run in this way and run in this way. And then we'll apply the loads. The load applied will depend on the size of the panel. And the load applied will depend on the size of the panel. So in this case, 7.5 meters by three meters. Uh, six meters so you get something like this and this is three meters so this side also will be three meters so this side also will be three point three point not so we can uh, assign this load by selecting a trapezoidal arrangement and uh, cancel, select your selection, design, frame loads, distributed. And I'm going to consider that uh, unit load will be acting on all these slabs. Then I can say, I'll go for the absolute distance, zero, up to three meters from 4.5 meters going up to 7.5 meters. I will have a magnitude of three here. Magnitude of three at this point. And uh, once I say yes, you can see the loads. And uh, here I have considered the load from half of, you know, the side on these, the loads will be transferred here. But if you look at this particular beam, you will see that the loads will be transferred from both sides. 
So now what I can do is I can select those beams. And here you get another beam that is, that will have that particular load transfer. And this is also an internal beam. Internal beam. But here the loads will come only from one side. Here the loads will come only from one side. So I have not selected these two sides. Whereas uh, this place, the loads will come from both sides. So I'm going to apply the load again. So what I do is sign frame loads distributed. I'm going to say add to the existing load. The same load will come again. And now you see that, you know, these loads have doubled and these are remaining as the ori original values. So, if you do that, it's okay. So we can do the same thing in the other direction as well. So we have selected those members. Now we can assign the loads distributed. So this goes up to uh, six meters and it's a triangular shaped load. So you can see the triangular shaped load. But for these internal members, it will act from both sides. So you have to consider that. So they also I'll get the loads doubled. So not on the corner ones. Then I can say assign distributed replace the existing ones. Now you can see those loads also have been numbered. And once you do that, we like to see that, you know, all these intersections that we have already created and then merged are brought to the original position. So what it says, divide frames, And here, now you can see all these are reversed back. And then here you can see uh, there's a short, there are two walls and a short beam. And generally those short beams can have a depth of about, uh, so then in our case, the float flow height is 3.6 meters. So uh, the height of the lift Dough is generally up to 2.1 meters. So you can keep a cavity of something like 2.3 meters for the lift, uh, to fixing of the lift. So if you have 2.3 meters here, and floor to floor height is uh, uh, 3.6 meters, then we are, we are going to have a beam of something like uh, 1.3 meter depth. So if I already defined that property and here you can see we have a beam of 1300 by 250. So we can assign that particular beam to all these and uh, you can say assign Sorry, not assign, uh, assign frame section, not loads, frame sections, 1300 by 250. So here now you can see, we have additional beams, 
but these inbound ones are 1300 by 250 and the same situation is prevailing here oh no here we have to allocate this is additional beam this also should be additional beam assign so now you can see we have sorted out all the loadings except here here we got we can have a one-way system and here the live loads also can be different because that's the place where the people are going to gather so because of that reason we we'll use a different uh, node, need node two, and assign frame loads. Unit slab two, and the width of the passage is 2.5 meters, so you get a load of 1.25. And we are not applied any load on it. So you can see display. Two. Oh, I think I have made a mistake. Oh, select, select, assign, ah, I have kept this, get rid of that. Now you can see it's a uniform load. So the advantage is that if you have different live loads, <coughs> if you have different live loads, we'll allocate different unit loads. So with that, uh, we have all the loads. And we'll take uh, about uh, 10 minutes break and after that I'll show you how to 